Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Remember in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus went to Jesus at night, said, what must I do to receive eternal life. Do you guys remember that discourse? It was a great question. I mean, turn with me to John 3, just so, just so I can show you this. In John's Gospel, now oh, everyone knows John 3.16. God so loved the world, he did what? Gave, Gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Read the verses just before John 3.16. It says, Jesus was asked by Nicodemus, w w what do I do? to have everlasting life. And Jesus answered him in, in John 3.3, 3, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus was like, well, how does a man who's old get like in his mother's womb a second time? I mean, that wouldn't fit. And Jesus says to him, I, I tell you truly, unless one's born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. For that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said you must be born again. He said the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it goes, where, where it comes from or where it's going. And so is everyone born of the spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him and said, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? He said, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, that we speak that which we know, and we testify of that which we have seen, and you don't accept our testimony. And if I've told you earthly things, and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He said, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, for, for, so that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. Remember Moses lifting up the serpent? We went over that when they got bit by the snake and they were going to die from the venom. What did they have to do? Look on that bronze serpent on the top of Moses' staff and instantly they would live. Just looking to the provision God made. Instant anti-venom without needles. I love it. Just a look. That's all you have to do, by the way, for the, for the, for the venom of sin that has poisoned all of us. We've all been bitten by that serpent, that snake, that little slimy snake. He's, he's got his fangs in every one of us, and we all have to look, just like the children of Israel had to look at that provision of God that God made and handed to Moses. Said, Moses, they, didn't like, they were grumbling against Moses. But God said, you want to live? Look at the staff in Moses' hand, that serpent on top. You want to live from your, from your sin? All you have to do is look at the staff which God provided. It's in the form of a cross. And what did he put on that cross? His son. He said, if you'll look at that, you'll instantly be healed from death, eternal death. You shall have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17 I love. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Isn't this beautiful? The Lord came to save us. And for he who believes in him is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Anyone here have an aversion to being judged besides me? Not really into having someone judge you? If you're not into being judged... Let me tell you, you need, to put your, you, you need to look up to the cross and put your faith on what Jesus did. Because as soon as you do, the Bible says you won't be judged. Jesus took the judgment of all our sin on himself. That's what he did on that cross. And when I say look to the cross, I'm saying look to that cross as, Lord, let that count for me. Let that, what he did, cover for me too. I, I, I'd like to be included in that. Remember the thief that was on the one side of Jesus we just studied? 
recently. He's he looks over at Jesus, and the other thief is mocking him. Hey, if you're the Son of God, why don't you get down off this cross? And you know, while you're at it, get us down too. Do you remember this part? Good Friday message. And what did the one thief say to the other one? Hey, shut up. Watch your tongue. We we deserve what we're getting. We 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 were we were thieves. We we did wrong. But this man, what did he say? This man has done nothing wrong. This one thief, the one was mocking, but the other one was like, I deserve what I'm getting. I'm guilty. But this man, has, he's innocent. And he turns to Jesus and says, please remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus promised him, he said, today, I tell you, this day, you shall be with me in paradise. Now, how many of you believe Jesus, what he said to that man? Was that, do you think that thief went into paradise that day? Yes. So I got a question for you. Did he go on any missions trip for Jesus? Did he, I don't know, join a church? Did he get baptized? Did he, what other rules do they make up that you got to do? Wear holy underwear? Get sealed in their temples. I don't know. There's so many things men make up that you got to do that they say you got to do to gain everlasting life. And the truth is, all you have to do is recognize that you're a sinner, and he wasn't. That's it. Bottom. The gospel is so simple. Men have polluted it, convoluted it, ruined it, and made it way, way not what it, gospel means. Good. What? Good news. And these guys, some of these guys preach it in a way that makes it like, ugh, that's not good. I mean, you're, you're like recoiling. Ugh, I don't know if I like that. It's because they didn't stick to the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity is, we're sinners. He wasn't. But if we look to him, just like those children of Israel looked to that bronze serpent on Moses' staff, they were bit by that snake, and they, they were going to die. They only had a couple minutes to make up their mind. But if they would look at the provision God made, God says, I'll heal you. I'll fix it. If you will look to the provision God made of his son on the cross, God promises he will fix your sin. He'll heal you of that eternal poison that's going to take you out forever. He will give you life. That's what he promises. He gives us life eternal. Now this part... I love because they didn't understand it, but we got hindsight, right? I mean, it's kind of, it's that hindsight is what, 2020? We get the privilege of looking back and seeing this stuff. But they were there the day it was going down. And they didn't actually get it. They're like, we didn't understand it yet. But one thing I like about the Lord is, you notice how he works with us in our understanding. He, he, he helps us grow and come along, you know, it's like, Go tell the disciples to meet me up by the Sea of Galilee. i got to, you know, help them in their faith. And you guys remember what they did? If you read the rest of John here, just extra credit, you can read the, the end of chapter 20 and 21, and you'll see that they met with Jesus again. First in the room, and, and he said, here, don't be unbelieving, be believing. Look at, and, and they, they got to see the holes in his hands and, and the hole in his side. But one of the guy wasn't there. Remember which disciple wasn't there? Thomas. They, they call him Doubting Thomas. Well, they're going, he's alive. It was him. We saw him. We, hit, we put a, our finger in his hand. We saw the whole thing. And, and Thomas goes, I'm not going to believe it unless I put my finger in the hole in his hand. You can tell these guys trusted each other, right? Fishermen, tax collectors, motley crew. You know, some people think of the apostles as these holy, perfect guys. They didn't even trust each other. And they bragged about which ones ran faster. They're just men. But Thomas is like, I don't believe you guys. But a week later, Jesus appears again. He says, here, Thomas, reach your finger in here. Go ahead. Go ahead, put your hand in my side. Don't be any longer unbelieving, but be what? Believing. And he also met them up by the Sea of Galilee, and he had a little discourse. They, they fished all night. How much did they catch that night? Does anyone remember? Nada. Zippo. 
And Jesus on the shore. Hey guys, haven't caught anything, have you? He doesn't say, have you caught anything? You read that account, you'll see he says, you haven't caught anything, have you? No. Put your net down on the other side of the, sh of, of the boat for a catch. Remember that? Was this the first time he had said, put your net down on the other side? Who can remember the Gospels? Do you remember the story when he first met Peter and James and John? By the way, what was their occupation, Peter, James, and John? Those three, they were fishermen. And they had fished all night and caught nothing. The first time Jesus met them, he said, Guys, can I borrow your boat? The crowd's a little big. They're pushing me into the water. Could you let me, uh, you know, and they put Jesus in the boat and put him in the water because the, the folks were pushing him right. I mean, they wanted Jesus so bad. They're right up, pushing him up to the, his heels into the lake. Lake Gennesaret, it's called in Israel, or Sea of Galilee. This is another name from a different period. Same, same body of water. They push him back and Jesus borrows their boat and their men in their nets listening to him. And when he gets done, he says, hey guys, you didn't catch anything. Why don't you go put your net out? And G Peter says, look, we did this. We're, we're professionals. We do this for a living. You're a great rabbi and everything. But somehow, Jesus, on this first encounter with, with Peter and James and John, he persuaded him, just do it. All right, we'll do it. You know, stupid rabbi. I mean, he's a great teacher and everything about God's kingdom and all, but this is fishing 101. We, we're, we're professionals. We fished all night. We didn't catch anything. You'll catch anything in the morning, you know. And by now, he's already been preaching. We don't know what that could have been like this time. This isn't the good fishing hour, you know. All right. And they went out and they put their nets down. What happened? They caught so much, their nets were breaking. After they just mended them. They filled the boat. They filled their partner's boat. The boats began to sink. And they went, who is this guy? And Jesus said, leave them. From now on, you'll be not fishers of fish. You'll be fishers of what? Men. Men. Come follow me. And Jesus, that was the day he called them. On the day that he's going to show them a little something that they will get. I don't know if you realize how personal the Lord is. He tailors the situation. So that, I mean, you, what do you say, deja vu? They get the same lake. Meet me up by the lake. See you, Galilee. I'll meet you guys up there after he's risen from the dead. Meet me up there. I've got to show you something. Fish all night. Don't catch nothing. Hey, guys, haven't caught anything, have you? No. Put your net on the other side of the boat for a great catch. They put their net on the other side of the boat. What happens? Fills up. They come dragging the net towards land. Peter, Peter, all of a sudden, bing, the light goes on. Wait a minute. This happened before. Do you realize it was Peter that threw off his garment and jumped in the sea? Uh, I'm sorry, he put on his old garment. He was stripped for work. He put on his garment, throws himself in the water, swims in. He goes, it's the Lord. How do you know it was the Lord? Because the same thing happened when he first was introduced to Jesus. Now, Jesus is introducing it to him in a way that nobody would mistake it. Peter, James, and John would know. That guy on the shore is the same guy we followed three years ago. That's got to be Jesus. That's not a, just some fella. And they came and there was the breakfast already prepared. And it says they came drawing the net to land. And those of you know that this is truly told by a fisherman. I didn't just want to show you something in John's gospel. John just happens to tell us. And they were dragging in the net. And there was how many fish? 153. And though the net, I'm sorry, uh, John 21, verse 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Only a fisherman is going to tell you that there was 153 fish in the net. Right? I mean, on the day when Jesus is going, I just want you to know it's really me. He fills the net. And yet it was so full, but it didn't tear. Only a fisherman's going to mention that in this story. You know, 
This is the, the greatest story ever told, the resurrection of the Messiah. And do they have to throw in how many fish were in the net? Just like you had to throw in who got to the grave first. The disciple whom Jesus loved outran the other disciple, Peter, slowpoke Peter. But slowpoke Peter threw himself in the water and swam in first. And he gets there, and these guys are, are just growing in their understanding that day, just like some of you are, that Christ is really risen, that he really rose from the dead. And I want to show you something in the book of Romans that Paul helps my understanding in this, because Paul explains it in ways. Now, Paul was a learned man in the Hebrew culture, knew all their, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, knew all their scriptures, knew all of the, the nuances of their prophecies, knew the promise of the Messiah even from Adam and Eve, from, to Eve, through the, through the persevering of your, uh, of your uh, pain in childbirth, is going to come the, the, the seed, the Messiah, to redeem. Even though sin has happened, God's going to, he's going to fix this. Well, Paul's writing to the church at Rome. If you'll turn with me to Romans he says here in Romans chapter 5, therefore, verse 12, I'm sorry, Romans 5, verse 12, therefore, just as though through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death, it says, spread to all men because now all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but it wasn't imputed when there is no law. But nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. Moses gets the law, and now they know they're blowing it. Before that, they didn't have the rules to know they were blowing it. They were blowing it. They just didn't have the rules. And so it's in, someone just went, dee, 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 dee. Is that that? He said, in, so even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type, Adam is a type of what? I don't know if you know Hebrew culture. Adam was a type of him who was to come. In other words, the Messiah. Adam is actually like a Messiah. How was Adam like the Messiah? I don't know if you realize this. Adam wasn't deceived by the serpent to partake of the fruit. Eve was. Eve was deceived and the serpent said, God doesn't want you to eat this because in that day you'll be like God. In that you shall know good from evil is how she would be like God. She, he didn't want to you know, go into details like, you'll be a God. Just eat this. No, you'll be like God. Now you'll know good from evil. Right now you only know good. Satan had deceived her. But the Bible doesn't say that Adam was deceived by that same deception. She brought the fruit and said, here, Adam. And Adam, it says, chose to eat. Why? I, I submit to you, he chose to eat because even though he knew eating was going to bring him death, what did he want to be? Who do you want to be with? His bride. Even in death, he would choose death to go be with his bride. You say, that's crazy. No, that's just one of those fatalistic love stories. He's willing to die and be with his bride. I mean, spiritually die. He's going to live in his physical body, but his spirit's going to die when he disobeys. And he chose. He did. But He's a type. Now pay attention to that very truth, because if you don't, you'll miss this. He's a type of who? Jesus. Let me show you this. Verse 15 says, For the free gift is not like the transgression. For, for if by the transgression of one many died, then much more did the grace of God and the, the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Just like sin got, came in through one man, well, listen to what Paul says. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, judgment arose from the one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then as the one transgression, it, it, it says, uh, there, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life 
to all men. For through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even through, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Through the obedience of the one. Who's the one? Jesus. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.